Join me in prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, Lord, may they be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today we continue our Christmas series in which we're looking at some of our classic Christmas hymns, the songs of the season. And we're not only looking at the song's history, but also the theological message that they bring to us. Our songs, all of our songs have meaning. And that meaning is meant to not only draw us closer to God, but to remind us of what we are and who we are as people of faith and what we believe. And while many Christian or Christmas songs are known by most people this season, whether you're Christian or, or non-Christian, 
um, as an astute follower of Jesus Christ, it's in our best interest to know what we sing and why we sing it. So last week we looked at the classic Christmas hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, uh, and we not looked at not only the history of the hymn and its long history in the Catholic Church, but also its history as it relates to the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah, a uh, messenger of God who warned the people of Israel and Judah of the dangers that they would fall into if they, if they fell away from God and God's path. And then Isaiah gives us this glimpse of hope, one that would come, that would be God living with us. This week, we turn to a controversial, contra controversial, controversial, controversial Christmas hymn. And it is not the message or the music of today's song that is controversial, but calling joy to the world, a Christmas song, is controversial. First, there, there, well, there's two main arguments that I would give to why it's not a Christmas song. Um, the first is that the song is based on Psalm 98 and not the Luke 2 nativity or the Matthew 1 and 2 nativity stories. Um, for me, something to be a Christmas hymn, I would expect that it would have something to do with maybe a baby, potentially a manger and some shepherds and some wise guys or something in the nativity story. But no, it, it doesn't. Um, and then we have the second issue of classifying this as a Christmas song. The psalm, Psalm 98, focuses on the second coming of Christ. More than the first coming of Christ into our world. The first coming of Christ being, of course, Christmas. The second coming of Christ coming at the end of all time and of all we know. Regardless, though, the song Joy to the World is one that is sung at Christmas time as well as at other times along the year. So the history, just to give you a brief history, the history of how this song came to be as we know it today um, has to do with three people, three collaborators, um, three unknowing co collaborators. The first was an English poet, and he was a dissenting clergyman. Um, a man by the name of Isaac Watts. And in 1719, Isaac Watts published a collection of his paraphrases of the Psalms. So he took the Psalms and then he wrote them in his own words. And he published them in a book called The Psalms of David, imitated in the language of the New Testament. It's a very long title. But the song that we know today Joy to the World, comes from the second part of his paraphrased psalm that was titled The Messiah's Coming and Kingdom. So we have Isaac Watts, who wrote this poem, this, this paraphrase of Psalm 98. The second collaborator had no idea, really, that he was a part of this piece. He was um, none other than, than George Frederick Handel, a popular German composer who lived in London. And Handel was a contemporary of Isaac Watts, but they didn't know that they were working together. It was someone else who took Watts' words and a portion of Handel's Messiah and paired them together and created the song that we know now. And that person lived across the sea in this new country that was formed in the United States in a city called Boston. There was a school teacher by the name of Lowell Lowell Mason, and Lowell Mason was a music teacher, actually. And Mason was an influential musician in his, of his time, and he published his own version of Watts words paired with Handel's music. And he published it in 1837, over 100, what, 120 years after the poem was written. Occasional Psalms and Hymn Tunes was the name of the work. And now, so many years later, we find ourselves with this treasured Christmas slash everyday hymn based on the Old Testament psalm set to the music composed by the English composer Handel and pieced together by a, uh, by a music teacher in Boston. Would you sing it with me this morning? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive. Sing, and heaven and nature 
because God has actively worked in the world, reaching out and touching humankind. Because of this interaction, salvation has come to humankind as God has not, nor will not, ever forget his people. And if this is the case, then we are to sing a new song. I read a story recently about a man uh, who came back from Vietnam. And, and when he did, he, he came back from Vietnam and he kind of went off the grid. And as the story goes, he was hitchhiking across California with, with his bag and he had a puppy and a guitar. I don't know why they emphasized that he had a puppy, but apparently he had a puppy. And he was hitchhiking across California and he got invited to have dinner with this group of college students who were having a Bible study. And so this guy goes with these, these young men and they, they, they start having their dinner and they let them spend the night and they have this Bible study where they're reading through the Gospel of John and through that night, that man found Christ. And when that happened, he was filled with, I quote, a new song. Actually, many songs that he'd start to sing and play on his guitar. So much so that the next night, they found him in the coffee shop playing his guitar and singing these new songs of God that he had found and discovered and how his life had changed. And I know that sounds so cliche of a story, but I think it, it, it illustrates why we sing a new song. When God actively interrupts our lives, the old song, the old songs, the songs we always sang, they just don't cut it anymore. For each of us here who have had that kind of experience, that divine moment in their life where they recognize God working in our lives, I ask, do you remember what it was like? How when you experienced God, everything looked new. It was like you were looking at the world through a new pair of eyes. And we, you're filled with a new joy and excitement. And that's what the, the psalmist is talking about. That God has done a new and amazing things. And the old song of our life doesn't capture the reality that we now think and feel. We need a new song to share with the world of the marvelous things that God has done. And this is the place where we are. In each and every song, poem, or writing, writing that speaks of singing a new song, we find this theme. Something has changed. We're now different. And the song, the poem, the writing that we were before no longer tells the story or the message that needs to be told. Sing a new song because who we are now is not who we were then. And that song that we sing should be great. So let's look at how the psalmist says we should sing. In verse 4, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. We're called to sing a new song, not for the sake of updated music, but as a response for the ways in which God has actively worked in our lives and world. Not a song of remembrance of the way things were, but a song of the new way that we now exist with God. How we sing is almost as important in my mind as what we sing. It was so important in the early Methodist movement that John Wesley actually wrote directions for singing know this? He wrote directions for how we're supposed to sing. And it was so important in the, in the Great Awakening that it was printed in the earliest hymnals on the front page so that everyone knew how to sing. To this day, if you find a United Methodist hymnal, the first page is John Wesley's directions for singing. And I'm not going to read them all to you because there is uh, I VII many. But this was his directions for singing. Uh, directions for singing. 
um, that this part of divine worship may be more acceptable to God as well as more profitable to yourselves and others. Be careful to observe the following directions. I'm going to skip the first few. Start with direction number four, which says, Sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, but lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of it being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. Directive number five, sing modestly. Do not bawl so as to be heard above or distinct from the rest of the congregation, that you may not destroy the harmony, but strive to unite your voices together so as to make one clear, melodious sound. I like this one. Directive number six, sing in time. Whatever the time is sung, be sure to keep with it. Do not run before nor stay behind it, but attend closely to the leading voices and move therewith as exact as you can, and take care you sing not too slow. This drawling way naturally steals on all who are lazy, and it is high time to drive it out from among us and sing all our tunes just as quick as we did at first. Seven, above all, sing spiritually. Have an eye to God in every word you sing. Aim at pleasing Him more than yourself or any other creature in order to attend strictly to the sense of what you sing and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound, but offered to God continually. So shall your singing be such as the Lord will approve of here and reward when we cometh in the clouds of heaven. What we sing and how we sing it has always been important to all of the religious groups that branch out of the Judeo-Christian faiths. Our earthly music must line up with the event that we are singing about. We would not sing a slow ballad at a celebration of the resurrection of Christ. Right? We're not going to go in, come in on Easter morning and sing something really slow and, and in a minor key. Just as we would not sing an upbeat praise song on Good Friday when we're mourning and remembering the death of Christ on the cross. The what and how of what we sing need to match. This is because the what we sing and the how we sing leads to the why. <clears throat> to praise God, to commune with God, to experience God as a community. The author of this psalm begins to teach us how to sing. Recalling the what we're about to sing of is the marvelous things that God has done. How God has changed our lives. How we're called to sing a new song. So to begin with, we are to shout for joy to the Lord. Which is a fun way to start any song, right? With a scream shout. Just so we are all on the same page here, let me explain to you what a shout meant in biblical times. The Hebrew verb that means shout in this text means a couple of different things. First, it's used to describe shouting as a war cry. We don't sing like that, do we? <laughs> a war cry, like show me your war face, kind of yell. When I think of this, I, I, I think of the yell of an angry person screaming at the top of the lungs. So I don't think that's exactly the meaning we're supposed to take. The second meaning of the Hebrew word of shouting is the shout of triumph over your enemies in the Hebrew. And this is like in the movies when there's been a great battle and at the end of the battle there's 20 people who are left alive and they're all on the same team and they all scream. That's the shout of victory. That they won the day. Again, I don't think that's exactly what is meant here. Because the third meaning in the Hebrew is the one that I'd like us to work up, and that is shouting in worship. And this is not the only place in the Psalms where we're instructed to shout in worship. Um, recall Psalm 41, where it says, Clap your hand, clap your hands, all you nations, shout to God with cries of joy. This, this is the kind of shouting that we are called to make, to cry out in praise.
praise to God because we are singing a new song, one that is made to express the joy we have because God has done a new thing and the world has found salvation. Interestingly enough, this, this new song that we are to shout out is not meant to be sung alone, as verse 4 says in the text. It says that all the earth should burst into jubilant song with music. Our songs of praise seem to be intended to be accompanied by instruments. Use the harp, the author says. And when, when I envision a harp, I envision that large, you know, half heart-shaped thing with the, with the Greek girl in there, doing this number, right? Because that's what's in the TV shows. But in all actuality, a couple thousand years ago, um, a harp, yes, was a stringed instrument, but it had somewhere between 3 and 12 strings, depending on who was playing it, how it was. So think about the, I, I would like to think about like the little chubby babies in the drawings with the little U-shaped thing. Because that's, you know, biblical. Little chubby baby angels. The harp over 2,000 years ago would have only had a few strings. And it would have had, you know, a chord. So then there were also trumpets, the psalmist says. Blow the horns. And we what we call trumpets today are, were actually straight cylinders made of metal that were blown. The horns, of course, were ram's horns or shofars, and all these instrument, instruments were meant to be played along with this new song that was being sung or shouted. And as verse 6 tells us, the why and who we sing to, we sing to joy before the Lord, the King. All this music was meant to be sung and played to, to one being, and that's to God himself. And when we do this, when we as humankind or as a congregation of people join together and sing in this manner, the author tells us that the whole earth sings. He says this in, in verse 7, Let the sea resound. And everything in it, the world, and all who live in it, let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. All the earth joins in the new song and praises God. The rivers and mountains, the whole world sings. And this song is not just a song of salvation from God. There's, there's a bigger picture at play here, and, and it's one that's kind of counterintuitive if you think about it. The last verse tells us the why. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. The world rejoices. All of creation rejoices, not simply because of salvation, because God is coming back again. And in that coming, God is going to judge the whole world and all peoples. And you might think, why would I shout for joy if I'm going to be judged? Well, we view judgment as the prelude to punishment in our time today. But the people of this time were being judged by leaders who didn't have righteousness who didn't treat people fairly, who didn't treat people in fairness. And so to look upon a God that was going to come back again, who was going to judge the world in a good way, was going to judge individuals who were faithful with righteousness and honesty and integrity, it was completely different than the judgments they were living in life. And so it was a cause to rejoice. Finally, to be recognized. Finally, to be judged for who I really am. Not for what the world's leaders tell me that I am. It was a cause for celebration. Today, as we, we live in the time where Jesus has already come into the world, into our world, during the first
first coming. We celebrate Christmas, but we know that Jesus was already born. We know that the world, all of creation, will one day be judged with this righteousness and fairness when Christ returns again. And this is what the psalm is talking about. That on that day, our new song of all that God has done in our lives, all of the ways in which God has reached down and touched our lives, we will join together in a song, a new song of this new heaven, this new earth, as one, recreated, restored, and we will shout with joy. And that joy will be for the whole world. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. This time we are going to move into a time of prayer and I would ask is there anything that you would like shared together as a community of faith this morning? Scott and family made it to Chicago. Yes, big to this. Safe travels for Dennis. Yeah. I have a crazy can of prairie sun. I'm happy I'm better. Over cold or over anything. So I'm better. But my sister Sharon, who is this way here in the hospital, she's having problems breathing. She doesn't feel what she needs. Prayers praise for healing and prayers for care is in the hospital. This is your birthday song. It is very long. No? I do <laughs> Praise for another trip around the sun. Anything else this morning? All right, let's go to God. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for the way that you are present in our lives. Lord, I ask that you would help us to sing a new song, that when we experience you in our lives, that when we see your working around us, that we would be filled with the joy that we have, a knowledge and a peace that passes all understanding because you are present. Help us to sing a new song in our lives for you, and let it be true. God, as we gather and come before you in prayer as a community of faith, Lord, we have so many things on our hearts as this time of season is, is trying and wearing on us all. We ask that you would be with, with Lucas scaring the Lord and his heart surgery that's coming up, that you would just be with the doctors, the nurses, the staff, and everyone involved, that your healing would come. Lord, we ask prayers for Karen this morning as she's having trouble breathing and she's in the hospital. Lord, we praise you and thank you for your presence. We, pray, we thank you for family coming to visit, for Scott's safe travel to Chicago, that you would help him to get all the way home, Lord. To Dennis as he travels, Lord, from North Carolina or to North Carolina, that you would, you would be present.
present and keep them safe. Lord, we're thankful for the ways in which you heal us. And Lord, we thank you for our birthdays and our opportunities to live one more day with you. God, we thank you for all of the ways that you are present, Lord. And we pray all of these things to you in the way that your son Jesus taught us when he said, Word of heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. This time, I invite you to stand as you are able as we continue in an attitude of worship as we sing, What Child Is This?
if you want to look through those, and while you're out and about doing last-minute Christmas shopping, if you see something you want to pick up, I'd invite you to bring it up um, Christmas Eve and put it under the tree. Are there any other announcements besides potluck today that I miss? Amen. Amen. Amen.